Kanji is breakfast. Kanji is a healing food when you're sick. It's also a healing food when you're young and a healing food when you're a little bit older. But on top of that, it's a blank canvas on which you can really, really innovate in anything. My name is Lucas Sin. I am the chef of Nice Day Chinese and Junza Kitchen, and we are making kanji today. Kanji, aka the porridge that civilizations were built on. This is rice. Rice is pretty easy to grow compared to fruits and nuts. It has a lot of nutrition in there, but when you eat it as is, it doesn't taste very good and the nutrients aren't fully unlocked. Early civilizations were able to cook rice grains to unlock both the flavor and the nutrients out of this grain. Now, in China, it's primarily rice. In some other places, it might be millet. In some other places, it might be rye, or it might be barley. But today, we're gonna to start with rice. In a lot of rice cultures, whether it's in, in Tamil in India, or it's in Japan, or in Korea, or China, rice has been a huge staple in the diet because of how easily it is grown. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't regional variation to the rice. Short grain rice is commonly associated with slightly colder climates. Once upon a time, jasmine rice stored with jasmine flowers has a little bit of an aromatic quality to it. So it just gives a little bit of an edge. So today the ratio we're using is two short grain rice, mostly for the texture and for its sort of cottony silkiness and jasmine rice for its sort of like rice rice flavor. We're gonna combine the rice and we're going to soak our rice for at least 30 minutes, preferably overnight. The name of the game, as I mentioned earlier, is in breaking down the rice grains to unlock flavor and nutrients. You can do that with heat and a lot of time, but soaking it makes it easier to break down. The number one kanji I probably grew up with is chicken kanji. Chicken has a sort of delicateness that lends itself really beautifully to the kanji, and the way we're gonna prepare this chicken today is gonna to capitalize not only on the velvety silkiness of the kanji itself, but the perfect texture of a poached chicken. We're going to rub a little bit of galangal powder. This is gonna go in the fridge overnight. All of the flavors concentrate, and the texture is gonna be super nice when we cook this tomorrow. You don't want to cook it all the way because you don't want to sacrifice this texture, but you do want to cook it enough that the flavor process has already begun. So this is a savory kanji, but there is sweet kanji as well. Famously, probably labajo. We're doing a savory kanji today, um, especially kanjis made with different grains, whether that's red bean and zuki beans or green beans, mung beans, or goji berries, dates, and that sort of thing. A lot of parts of Northern China like to eat their kanji sweet. Um, I grew up eating it primarily savory. There are analogies to this in Western cooking, sous vide, basically. You could use this broth as the basis of your kanji. You can also use it for your noodle soups or anything else later on. Both century egg and dry scallops are a huge part of what we grew up eating in Hong Kong. It punctuates a lot of those flavors because it's got a little bit of that seafoodiness, but also sort of like deep umami savory notes. So just to prepare the kanji from a scientific perspective, there are two main things you really need. You have the starch in this kanji and as it boils, the grains are gonna move up and down inside of the pot. They're gonna bounce around, they're gonna start breaking up. But as they move up and down, what you want them to do is you want that starch to start capturing oil and water together in this process we call emulsification. So because there is relatively little oil in our chicken stock, we're gonna have to introduce a little bit more oil into the rice itself. And to help that starch break down, we're gonna add a little bit of salt. Get this rice drained. Here are the rice grains. They're gonna break up really quite easily, which is a good thing. This is a century egg. It's a duck egg that has been preserved, essentially, in salt and quicklime, among other things, and clay, usually, which produces this honestly really beautiful dark black and green color. Importantly, in the context of a Cantonese cuisine, this century egg is a little bit basic, which means that it'll raise the pH of the rice, which again, helps it break down a little bit more. Look, how cool is this? Amazing. So we're gonna break down this century egg into our rice. Kanji, for me, is made at about a one to 10 to, or one to 12 ratio, which means that you're not eating that much rice. The water and the liquid really helps to stretch out the meal to make you feel a little bit more full. The reason why we eat kanji when we're sick is for 
primarily two reasons. I'm no doctor, but what I'm told is, first, it helps lubricate the digestive tract, and it also assists the spleen in digesting whatever food is coming in. But second of all, which I think is perhaps really, really interesting, is when we're eating congee, we're also abstaining from other foods. The congee will fill us up, so you'll stay away from fatty foods, we'll stay away from those spicy things, and other things you're not supposed to eat when you're sick. I just watched the second season of Survivor in the Australian Outback. Real life advice. People on Survivor should be eating congee because congee is a meal that you eat in times of need, whether in sickness or it's early civilization and you don't have that much culinary technology. You can stretch your meals, you can stretch your rice to make yourself more full. That's literally probably how kanji began, as a way to unlock, again, flavor, nutrients, and just, just good eating from a grain that is shelf life stable, easier to grow than fruits and nuts. Stock or liquid in the pot first, rice is gonna go in. And when we get to cooking our kanji, water is the sort of the easiest thing, but of course, if you wanna give it flavor, a little bit of chicken stock. Short break. <laughs> Etymology lesson. Kanji, C O N G E E, seems to come from the Tamil word in southern India, kanji, K A N J I, which eventually makes its way over to Portugal, that then becomes anglicized to kanji, C O N G E E, which is to say that there is Portuguese kanji. In Portuguese kanji, the rice isn't, doesn't break down as much as Chinese kanji does. Um, you kind of want the grains to be a little bit more intact in uh, almost like risotto-like maybe uh, in, in a Portuguese context. It's really a blank canvas, but this is how I like to do it to get the type of texture that I want from my kanji. Rice is gonna go in into rolling boiling water and we're gonna maintain this heat for the first maybe five to 15 minutes. We're gonna start stirring immediately to make sure it doesn't um, burn at the bottom. Can you do it with skipping all these steps? Yes, you can. Many, many types of kanji all around the world will be cooked from unsoaked grains. It might take a little bit longer and the texture might come out as a little bit different, but at the end of the day, you're unlocking the flavor potential in something as simple as rice. Fact of the matter, every single grain, every single culture has a freaking flatbread and every single culture has a freaking dumpling and every single culture has a freaking grain porridge. The reason for that, my friends, is because people do things with grains. You introduce water and heat in different times, you mill grains to different uh, textures and everybody will end up with very similar foods with the type of grains that they grow in their local areas. What gets interesting is when uh, it is number one in terms of agriculture, what grains do you use, what fillings do you use, what else do you add to that base? And second of all, what sort of textures are preferred? A certain culture might prefer a velvety, silky kanji. Another one might want a little bit more bite. Somebody might want a flakier flatbread. Other cultures might want something a little bit more doughy. That's how food ways moves around the world, my friends. Recipes and ingredients get shared as people move but the ingredients change because they're in different areas. Ingredients don't move the way ideas do, recipes do. Dried scallops are literally that. They're dried under the sun, multiple stages. Yes, it's actually indeed quite complicated, but a dried scallop compared to a fresh scallop will taste more like a scallop. The texture will be a little bit different because it's dried, but that flavor is still gonna be there. At the end of the day, a lot of these dried seafood, whether it's dried scallops or salted cod or wu yu from Taiwan, which is a salted cod roe, it's about preserving the ingredient, stretching out the peak of the season, stretching out a really beautiful, perfect moment throughout the rest of the year. Very much like kanji is about stretching out the grain to be a more uh, fulfilling meal than rice in and of itself. Now that this kanji is at this stage, um, we know that the starch has been gelatinized. We're gonna turn it down a little bit to medium high and we're gonna put a lid on it. Taking the chicken out of the water, beautiful color. Even if you look beyond China, you'll see um, different grains being used for porridge or congee-like things. Grits, at the end of the day, polenta, um, are also in this some form a way of adding water and heat to grain to extract flavor and texture um, and nutrients. In some ways, you, one might be able to think of this as a type of oatmeal, and if you think about it, many, many of these cultures have these grain porridges as the first meal of the day. A lot of cultures like to garnish their kanjis with different things and mix different things in at different stages. One of my favorites is the Filipino arroz caldo, which has calamansi and a little bit of a quail egg over the top, or sometimes a regular egg as well. You see how shiny this kanji is? And when you're pulling your spoon through it, the grains have kind of mostly dissolved into little finer pieces. This to me is a good kanji. 
The congee is a very, very humble dish. It's not like banquet cooking. It's first thing in the morning for breakfast. Or uh, in a lot of contexts, it's late night with stir fries, with pickles. Sometimes it's eaten just as a bowl of rice with other things. Sometimes it's a composed dish as it is here. This is Hong Kong style satin, gaijok, shatin, chicken congee. It's one of the infinite routes congee has taken throughout the world. This is just a small region inside Hong Kong, in southern China. And this is the type of chicken congee I grew up with. But at the end of the day, chicken congee has gone all over the world. It starts off in humble origins, but can really go anywhere. Nice, super easy, velvety. And this is how I like to eat it, with a Chinese spoon in one hand and chopsticks in the other.